She's an actress or actor. Uh, she is perhaps uh, known to you as uh, an actor in Biker Grove, if you're uh, from that generation, or Casualty or Waterloo Road. Uh, but she's also the founder of the Happy Me Project. Would you please give it up and a massive Coventry round of applause for Holly Matthews. Oh, it is on. Good, good, fantastic. So I stand here, I've already cried, nearly cried about three times already, by the way. So if I do cry during this, then you'll just have to deal with it, really. Uh, I stand here in front of you as a businesswoman. And in a room full of such skill and expertise, I can safely say that my route to becoming a businesswoman has definitely not been conventional and it has certainly not been pretty. However, I hope that by the end of my chat with you guys today, that you will recognize that there really isn't a perfect way. You've just got to keep learning, keep bouncing back, and just never give up. So I'm gonna take you back to young me. Growing up in Newcastle upon Tyne, in the northeast of England, with my dad, Brian, who's at the back there, Give him a wave, Dad. <laughs> He's come to watch today, which is nice. My dad, Brian, who was a welder at the time. Uh, my mom, Claire, who worked in a bank. And my younger sister, Becky. A normal working class family. I did definitely not grow up in a showbiz family, in the entertainment industry. There was no drama schools or celebrity parties. There was very little money. You know, We just grew up in a normal household. So when at nine or 10 years old, I came to my parents and I went, I want to be an actress. I'm sure there was a few bemused looks, but they were very supportive. And when I, at 11, heard about a TV show set in Newcastle called Biker Grove, a kid's TV show, I knew that I wanted to be part of it. My dad spoke to the casting director and they said, write a letter. Now this letter, I've spoken about for many years, and I feel like it had become something of an urban legend, because I hadn't seen this letter uh, since I wrote it. However, on my 30th birthday, I was presented with this canvas with the letter on it. Now, you are more than welcome to come and have a look and laugh at this. However, there is a warning. If we have any designers in the room of any kind, it has been done in Comic Sans. I know, I know, I said there's a few people, <laughs> I know. Uh, just warning you, I said I was warning you. And I've also, where I discussed my green eyes, I've done it in green and brown hair brown because I'm visual. So I like to, uh, you know, just helping you out. So I'm gonna read this to you. There is a point to it, other than that it's just endearing and sweet and it's, it's childlike. Uh, so I said, Dear D, production manager, a couple of weeks ago, my dad phoned you to see if I could get a part in Biker Grove. I've put it in um, speech marks. I'm not sure why. Like, it wasn't Biker Grove. He was told to write a letter telling you about myself. Well, here it is. <laughs> my name is Holly Wilkinson, which was my name at the time. I am 12 years old, which was a lie. I was 11. But you know when you're younger and you kind of big up your age? I'm 12 now. It's like six months away, but whatever. Um, with dark brown hair and green eyes. I've been doing drama for six years and I'm currently attending the Tyne Theatre Stage School, it was my acting class I did on a Saturday in Newcastle, where I'm doing my Lambda exams in November. I've been in many productions for my school and drama groups and I'm interested in any opportunities that you could give me. I am not shy one bit. <laughs> and I would love a part in Biker Grove. I would enjoy being on TV it would give me that extra push forward that I need. And then I've went to the bottom and I've just put, I would love a part, and then like loads of exclamations. And then yours, hopefully, Holly. And then at the very bottom I've put, please write back as soon as possible. I was excited. Now for some unknown reason, they did actually give me a part in that show after quite a few auditions. And uh, I did seven years in that TV show, which in TV land is quite unheard of, so I was very lucky. I left that TV show to sign a record contract with Sony as a solo singer. Went from TV to doing the singing. And I suddenly found myself going from celebrity party to showbiz event to TV show. 
I was going from Disney, Nickelodeon, Top of the Pops, MTV. I had pound signs in my eyes and I was definitely 100% within six months going to be best friends with Jennifer Lopez and Britney Spears. It's happening. Wrong. My single slumped in at 32 in the UK charts. It went out on the Radio 1 chart show on the Sunday. Monday morning, I took a call to say, it's been nice working with you, goodbye. Wow. My first failure and the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Because that taught me what I need, what I needed to get me to where I am today. In that moment, I took stock and I went, what is it that I want? What is it that I want right now? And I knew I wanted to be an actress, so I got back to basics. And I thought, I'm gonna be a proper actor. You know, I've been a child actor. I'm gonna go to drama school. That sounds proper, right? So I got myself a place at one of the top 10 drama schools in the UK. I then dropped out of one of the top 10 drama schools in the UK. I got myself a regular role in a show called Waterloo Road for the BBC. And I then bounced around doing TV show to TV show, as Dave mentioned, BBC Casualty, Doctors, which took me to the Midlands, The Bill. And I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. I was a working actress. However, acting is contract work. And I decided very early on that I didn't want to be a skint actor. I just didn't want to be that person waiting for the phone to ring and twiddling my thumbs. So I decided that I would create my own work, whatever that meant, whatever that meant, that I could create my own work and that I would essentially just never have to work for anybody else. I've never had a proper job, whatever that really is. And before I came to this, I thought about all of the different ways that I've made money over the years. And I had to, I don't normally write stuff down, but I actually had to write this down because it's a lot. And I thought I'd read you some of the, the ones that I've got on here. There is, there is a lot, um, and this is just really just skimming the surface. So I'm gonna tell you some of the ways that I have made money. I promoted nightclubs in hot pants and roller skates. I handed out flyers dressed as a yogurt pot. I taught people, I've taught people confidence. I set up an adult acting class here in Coventry. I've sold tequila in strip clubs. I worked uh, with an actor's photography business. I taught, I've taught actors how to do accents. I've worked with brands to create content. At one point, I did an acrylic nail course, which probably lasted all of two minutes. Uh, I create online courses. I chaperoned the Andrex puppy, big times. I sold t-shirts, I ran a network marketing business, I spoke at events, I've trained people on job interview technique, I've done voiceover work, vlogged, blogged, got paid to post on social media, and essentially just done everything possible to never have to work for anybody else or get a proper job. It's a lot of stuff. At 26, I became a mom of, I've got two girls, Brooke, who's now seven, Texas, who's five. And the parents in the room will know that when you become a parent, you reassess everything. And both me and my husband at the time decided that we wanted to take a financial hit, but be home with our kids. And, and that was important to us. I brought all my work closer to home. And for a few years, we were, you know, we were good, you know, family work. I was working, money was coming in. There was lots of successes. And me and my husband spent most of our days pottering around, drinking cups of tea and just living our lives as we wanted to. Then in 2014, we got the news that everybody dreads. My husband had cancer, brain cancer, the kind of cancer that you know no matter what happens, your life is never gonna be the same again. And I can vividly remember coming home from the hospital and being on my own for perhaps the first time since his diagnosis. I remember walking into my house and looking around at my house and nothing made sense. Nothing made sense anymore. And I sat down on the kitchen floor and I cried. The real deep cries, the cries when you think that you're never gonna stop, the ugly cries. And in that moment, I had more clarity than I've ever had in my entire life. Because I realized that if I wanted to be happy, 
if I wanted to continue living a life that we loved, then it was down to me. And I decided in that moment that I would do whatever it took to get me and my family through this time in our life. So I picked myself up off the floor, I dried my eyes, I put on a ton of makeup, and I got to work. During the time of Ross having cancer, you know, we're doing the rounds of the radio and the chemo and the brain surgeries. Amongst those, I built myself a life coaching practice. I'd always worked on mindset. Being an actor, you have to learn how to bounce back. Because as an actor, you will have more knockbacks in one week than most people have in their entire working life. So I had always been interested in self-development. During this time, I dug even deeper and I did more workshops, I read more, I, I learned more, I got more qualifications. And, and the more that I did that, the more people came to me. So for every brain surgery, every doctor's appointment, there was another success. And for a few years, we lived a really happy life in amongst all that cancer stuff. In July last year, Ross couldn't keep that cancer at bay anymore. I'm definitely gonna cry at some point. Um, and after a month in Mighton Hospice, who, if any of you have had any experience with Mighton, will know they're incredible, we lost Ross. During my time in the hospice, I looked for guidance. I looked for somebody ahead of me that had thrived during adversity. Somebody who was showing me that you didn't have to be broken by this. I didn't want to be broken. I'm, I was 32 with two kids. I don't want to be broken. And so I looked for that, those people. I was on Google in the hospice and I found it difficult to find anybody speaking openly about these kind of topics. So I decided that if there wasn't anybody doing it, then I would be it. So sat by my husband's bedside, I vlogged and I blogged and I talked openly about our pain. I also talked openly about the good stuff around it because that's the nuance of grief and sadness. There is good alongside the bad. And in doing that, I created a whole new platform there was a lot of press and publicity surrounding Ross's death. And I have, at the time, hundreds and hundreds of messages a day from people going through similar things or people, just going, people who just aren't able to cope with the normal overwhelm of life. And they looked to me and they went, how is she as okay as she is? I care about other people and I care that everybody gets to live a life that they love. That's my passion. And I felt that I was shortchanging people by sending them a Facebook message saying, I'm sorry to hear what you're going through, this is rubbish. You know, I, I couldn't explain it in a couple of messages on Facebook. It's not enough. So I did what I do as the entrepreneurial brain that I have, and I decided to put the Happy Me project together. In November last year, I put together the 21-day online positivity course. It was everything that I've learned packaged up put into a 21 day course that when I spoke to people, I could go, there you go, this is it, this is what I'm doing. Do that and that will be a great starting point. I had no idea whether it would be a success. It hadn't honestly even crossed my mind. It was more of a necessity to be able to help more people. It has been a success. And I've now had hundreds of people through its virtual doors. Alongside that, off the back of it, I created the workshops that sit alongside it. And I've now done six sellout workshops, both here in Coventry and up in Newcastle. I've started to, I'm gonna be doing other cities and I've started to call it a tour because it sounds like really rock and roll and I'm trying to make it sound cool. I'm on a workshop tour, sounds great, yeah? It's been a huge success. And alongside all of the tough stuff that we've gone through as a family, lots and lots of good things have happened. In my work and life, as a businesswoman, there's been highs, there's been lows, there's been failures, there's been successes. There is no definitive route. I am absolutely passionate about helping people in business, helping people to create a life that they love. And I am relentless in the pursuit of helping people to do that. Success is different to everybody. And everybody in this room will measure success very differently. 
And I stand here today feeling pretty successful, and I'm going to share with you and finish up on what my definition of success is. And it is summed up in a quote by Bob Dylan. And it goes, a man is successful, a woman in this, in this instance, a man is successful when he wakes up in the morning and he goes to bed at night and in between, he does what he wants. And I hope that you guys get to do as much as you want in your lives. Thank you for having me, guys.